Welcome to Resolving Reality. My name is Emmett, the creator of the ResolvingReality.com website and host of this podcast, Resolving Reality Radio. Resolving Reality is an independent Irish media platform that examines national and global issues, featuring opinions and topics not covered in the mainstream media, including the alternative, the politically incorrect, the undiscovered and the ignored. Check out the website for all our social media links and platforms, which you can find in the footer on each page. Follow us on Twitter at Resolving or both capital R's. Find us on YouTube, where you can listen to the podcasts, but also watch our video content. And don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. We are on Mixcloud, but if you prefer to listen to the podcast in higher quality WAV audio, click on the SoundCloud icon to visit the Resolving Reality SoundCloud profile, where you can download the episodes in high quality as well. Resolving Reality Radio is now on Stitcher and iTunes, plus check out our BitChute profile and you will find all those links right there on the website resolvingreality.com. This is Resolving Reality Radio. In these fast-changing and psychotic times, there is a wave of monoculturalism that is now spreading across the civilized world. A wave of cultural transformation that seeks to wash away the uniqueness of various peoples and the lands in which they live. Ireland and Irish culture, having been progressively eroded over the centuries, is now almost completely erased in the name of progress and so-called progressivism. Irish culture, along with any remaining Irish sovereignty, is disappearing thanks to globalism and the invasion, once again, of foreign ideologies. Now, more than ever, it's important to remind ourselves of Ireland's incredible culture its unique history, its eternal beauty, and the ancient origins that are the foundations of its story. My guest for this subject is none other than Michael Tassarian, who is a prolific author and public speaker and a veteran of the truth and so-called alternative research community. His many books cover such topics as occult and ancient history, mythology, philosophy, astrotheology, German Idealism, The Female Psyche, plus his acclaimed book, Atlantis, Alien Visitation and Genetic Manipulation, and The Irish Origins of Civilization, Volumes 1 and 2. To find out more about Michael and his vast body of work, and the subjects we cover in this interview, visit michaeltessarian.com and irishoriginsofcivilization.com. Hello, Michael, and welcome to Resolving Reality Radio. Thank you, Emmett. It's uh, lovely to be on. Nice to be invited. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's great to have you here. And um, in, in today's show, we're going to be discussing um, a, a favourite subject of mine. I'm not an expert in it, but we're very interested in it, which is Irish mythology and uh, ancient history and the, the kind of culture of Ireland, pretty much, and, and where it came from. And, um, you know, I've, I've been familiar with your work over the years, and it's kind of been a while since I've been um, paying attention to the material. So I've had a little crash course recently. I'm a little bit rusty, but I suppose it's not a bad thing because um, people who are listening who are new to the material will get a nice little foundation and it'll be a nice um, a revision course for me as well. So will we start off with um, just some of the basics again for people who are new to this sort of thing? Um, and I suppose we could probably go in chronological order and start with the official end of things because that's what people normally rely on. So like how, how far back does the official story or history go in Ireland, Michael, and kind of what are the sources? Are they academic and are writers based in Ireland or, or from elsewhere? Well, academic is part of the problem, right? The, the thing is controlled. You know, my research has shown me that uh, the Jesuit control and other, other controlled British government, British crown, what we're dealing with is so garbled. And the dates, as you very well start off with, are, are key to this because, and I'm not, I'm, you know, my research is not the last word on it as well. I've even recently had to update that. But but uh, let's take the founding of Rome, right? It's about 700 BC. And some people might think that's very young when they hear that being said, and others might think, oh, that's very ancient. But it really isn't. So around six, around six to 700 BC, a lot of activity was happening in Ireland. And normally, officially, academically, that is when, uh, if you have to go back to a medieval, excuse me, not a medieval, but a, a mythological cycle, right? So a prehistoric Ireland, begins about then officially. And I went along with that for the best part of, you know, 20, 30 years, because where's the evidence to 
say earlier. There's mythological evidence to say a lot earlier, but it's mythological. It talks about things that are not accepted academically, like uh, earth changes, cataclysmic events, uh, very mythological type beings, for instance, like the Fomori or even the Tuatha Dé Danann afterwards, you know, that kind of thing. That, th there's no way that that's going to be academically accepted. So you have to already break the consensus, you see? So again, back to the, the main point uh, that Normally, officially, you're going to see it start, and they'll concede, right? And by God, you even have to pull teeth for that. But they'll concede that about 500, 600 BC things are happening. Now, you and I know that that's nonsense. Anyone who's been to Newgrange, anybody who's been to the various sites like Navan, Ardmacher, right? I don't care what it is, right? Uh, Carol Keel. These are thousands of years old, right? At least 5,000. Some of them even think 5,000 BC, not 5,000 years from where we are, but 5,000 years even BC. And that already nullifies, you know, the academic uh, approach, as it does if you're dealing with Mesoamerica or anywhere else. So it's the maverick community, people that are my mentors, and then, uh, you know, the Commons Beaumonts of the world and the Ignatius Donnellys and that kind of people, Anna, Anna Wilkes, you know, who have really got the real handle on this. And then recently, Ralph Ellis' work comes to bear, of course, here. Uh, his discoveries impact what we know about Ireland. So my, to answer your question, is that my feeling now is that the thing starts about a thousand years prior to that. And then to meet people halfway to be generous, I'd say, let's go 500 years back from 500 BC to 1000 BC. And this would be only a, maybe three, 400 years after the demise of Akhenaten, who plays a big role in my life. You see the Egyptian connection. And then I think... His descendants, uh, you know, and this would involve several people. Uh, not his daughter is probably the most important one when it really comes down to it, right? But if we pull back from the canvas a bit from her, then there's others intermediaries. There's Tutankhamun. There's the Pharaoh Aya, and these people have Irish connections. Okay, so uh, that, we have to go back then. And then the only thing to add to that is that if you really want to go back, if you really want to do something that makes the academic world shake to its core, then you have to go back to the first dynasty of Egypt. The King Menes and his tomb, his burial site is in County Tyrone. Now you're dealing with even thousands of years before the dates we've just been speaking of. So the thing just boils over at that point and the academics are running in all directions. And yet in County Tyrone at a place called uh, Nakhmani, which everybody knows is the Hill of Manes, we're talking about the first pharaoh of the first dynasty. We're way back way back 4,000 years BC in terms of even Egyptian mythology. And these are strong connections, but they've been suppressed by this, uh, the elite and the establishment authors. And yet, if you know where to go, like I do, you'll find academics who will concede every point I'm making. People like Lorraine Evans, who wrote the book Kingdom of the Ark, and uh, people of that ilk. There are people who admit this, but they're hard to find. And, you know, my work is partly largely based on locating this evidence uh, from academic sources you know, that are credible sources, E.A. Wallace Budge and, and so many other people we could mention. Mm. So, yeah, and the key to it, like you said, is w with stuff of this nature, um, you really need to go off road like to try to get to the bottom of things straight away. And um, yeah, so so they're only going back a few thousand years. And even, you know, when we're looking at the, the sites that you mentioned, they're the obvious kind of giveaways, you know, like when you're looking at Newgrange, you know, we've all been there, been there myself recently, and it doesn't take much to kind of immediately make people, it should be obvious and make people think straight away that the official story isn't quite cutting it here. It's quite right. I mean, there's nothing that we're saying that's spurious at all. If you go to these sites and the astronomical, the geomantic precision, they don't even know how to build a corbel structure. In New Grange is a ceiling that nobody on earth can build. Just like they can't build a sarcophagus that they find in Saqqara or even the King's Coffer and the Great Pyramid. Well, look, forget Egypt. Forget the flicking Sumerians. Let's just deal with Ireland, what's on our doorstep, and then spill over into, you know, features that you see in Wales and other parts of England. Avebury, Stonehenge. There's thoughts that even some of the stones in Stonehenge could actually come from County Kildare in Ireland. What the hell is going on? There's enough mystery. But the thing is, a lot of that mystery has been extrapolated by the people that I deal with. My whole Irish origins work was uh, just simply started off as a dedication to Commons Beaumont, right? Who was, uh, you know, a great mentor of mine, an Englishman who went to every headland and every <laughs> conceivable site on the British. Who's ever heard of this guy? You know, these Johnny come lately's in today's world, random house is printing. Their, you know, these people are taking the credit. 
There's not a thing that they're iterating that hasn't already been iterated by my major people in the past, like Commons, Beaumont, Connor McAdory, Ignatius Donnelly, and Anna Wilkes, and a bevy of other great people. They're just reiterating their stuff, but they've airbrushed the name of these greats out. My job is to go back as a purist and resurrect the work of, of a Connor McDory or Emmanuel Velikovsky, because it, 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 it's, to me, dreadful and obnoxious that their names are forgotten. So there's many elements to my work. It's not just the pure history or pushing the boundaries and being, you know, controversial and, and, and being a maverick. And that's all part of it, but it's a minor part of it. The, the basic motive of my work in, in this regard, you know, what we're talking about, and in every other field that I deal with, is to make sure that graves are not left unattended because great, great minds broke the consensus in the 1800s and the 1900s to bring forth this information. What are we going to do? Just forget about it and wait till some Johnny come lately, you know, packages it in a, and it's in Waterstone's freaking window and then, that, then it's all right. Then you can accept it or it's on Channel 4 or whatever. No, that's not satisfactory. I'm glad for that. I'm glad that those productions exist. I'm dead glad those books exist. But by no means should somebody think that that's where it started in the 1980s with the Da Vinci, you know, the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail or whatever else you've got in the 90s. This thing, this study goes right back to the turn of the century. And some of the finest work was done then. And I never lose sight of that. You see, whether it's to do with ley lines or the history of Ireland or the history of the church and the suppression and all the rest of it. There's such a story to be told here. And then maybe the other motive for me was the fact that I was incensed that the more I read from a Geoffrey Keating, you know, some of the ancient books of Ireland, the Annals of Ireland, the, the ancient uh, chronicles of uh, Scotland, I started to become aware then that we've got another problem, and that is that uh, uh, the, not only are the greats being suppressed, but there's a story here of desecration, and that in almost every book I've read, even if it happens to be on the Druids or, you know, the history of Ireland, the destruction of the Druidic culture is a footnote in almost all the books, not all, but, you know, books that people would never have heard of. Maybe it's it's done a little bit better with, but these are out of print books, so I'm not, I'm not counting those. I'm counting about books that you could get from a wide variety of, of Celtic scholars and well-meaning Christian scholars even. And, uh, you know, oh my God, all over the world, we're talking about the Native American Indian destruction, this, and the conquistadors and, and, the, and the Maya and the Aztecs, that, right? And, and, and the destruction of these people over here and over there. Well, hold on. Why is the destruction of the Druids a bloody footnote? Nothing more than that in most books. A, a paragraph is what you get in some of the finest books on this subject. And I just went, this is unbelievable. They're wailing and crying about, you know, the spotted oil or whatever, you know, and, and this monumental massacre that affected not just the time that it happened, but the rest of the fate of the West. The whole Western world's, you know, traditions and history is affected by the destruction of the servants of truth and the servants of light. And all the sorcery we know today, both politically and historically and institutionally and educationally, all of these obscenities arise out of the destruction of this class of the servants of truth. And that's a footnote in most people's book, a genocide of unimaginable proportions. And you're wondering about some Timbuktu, you know, a catastrophe that took place and not this. That's unacceptable to me. So my Irish blood did really get up at that. And I said this, no, no way, no way am I going to allow that. So it's it's not just a question that there was like um, a, a omissions or mistakes made. This is a deliberate kind of um, uh, an occulting of history, I suppose, which we can we can expand on more when we get into the Druids for sure. And I mean, you made the point there that you know you need to go off road and to kind of go into the mythology to to get to the bottom of things and try to piece things together from that. Or um, so I mean, how far back does the m m mythology go? And I mean, how important is it to understand the history of Ireland? Well, even officially, it's, it goes back to what they call the flood. Uh, they do think of it as a mythological cycle, so none of the academics are actually accepting that any of this happened. But if we, I, I believe, you see, the key to what I do, right, people open a book of mine or whatever, or go to the website, they're never going to make any progress unless they understand one fact. I accept the myths and legends of the whole world as fact, not in a stupid way, but in a, uh, in a rational way. So, this already is going to uh, this is already going to distinguish you from those people who really make a hard dis, uh, a categorical difference between what we call fact and what we call you know uh, mythology. To me, the mythology is fact, and it actually contains more fact than we can even imagine. So, when the ancient uh, or even when the academics are talking about the flood in this more sort of a generic and general way, I'm looking at that being the deluge, 
just as Commons Beaumont instructed people, and just like Ignatius Donnelly, that's why I mentioned those names earlier, it's very important to do so, because they factor in Atlantis. They factor in the destruction of the old world, the, cat the cataclysm that then sent people to Britain, Britain being a remnant, you see. And this has impact then on what Plato said, because in Plato, you don't get that he's talking about the Northwest. But actual hands-on testing, hands-on geology, you know, and all of this other speculation, even the astronomical aspect, maybe we can touch on that later, definitely leads us not to places speculated by Plato, but up further up, past the pillars of Hercules, which actually is a giant's causeway and, and Fingal's cave over in Scotland. The pillars of Hercules are not to be found in the Mediterranean. They're not part of Gibraltar or whatever. They are, they are the famous well known to ship people at the time. The ancient mariners knew exactly where the pillars of Hercules were. Because the Hercules in Celtic mythology is Oma or Ogma, O G M A, God of Strength. And his pillars, later reprised in the Finn McCool story, uh, this is how mythologies happen, uh, are the pillars of Hercules, or, or the, as I said, the uh, Giant's Causeway. So the actual Atlantis is in that direction. Well, Look, it doesn't take a rocket scientist then to work out where it was. It's part of uh, the Northern Hemisphere, and that includes England and Ireland, Scandinavia, and even possibly Greenland, uh, Iceland, and part of the Arctic. And as a matter of fact, geology accepts that there is a sunken continent called Appalachia right, right there. That there is indeed not only just devastated forests going on for thousands upon thousands of miles, uh, I write about all of this in the Atlantis book and also in the Irish Origin, you see, and that there is indeed remnants of a culture. And then about a few years ago, now we're not talking many years ago, it couldn't be more than 10 years ago when the Natural, National Geographic did a deep survey of all of the coastlands of Britain, they confirm cataclysm, not uniformitarianism. So all the uniformitarianism, all the classic geology was completely dashed. I have the, I have the facts of this in various places and on the Irish Origins website. And yet that again was airbrushed. We never saw the consequences of that. We never saw the follow-up of that extremely expensive National Geographic survey of the coastlines of England and Commons Beaumont was absolutely validated. That it, all the shelves that you can't see because the water covers it, but they did the sonar. They've done this uh, with a new technology and they discovered that the shelves show absolute 100% evidence of cataclysm, not a slow, gradual, uniformitarian you know, motion as your Lyles and your Gizes and your various and your Geekies and all of these original cheating, lying academics, right, who knew what was going on but couldn't for the sake of their careers admit whether it came to nosophilia or it came to, you know, the, the movement and the strange behavior of animals or these woolly mammoths, all the things that one has to get into, right, all the strangeness of it. But getting back to your point, ancient mythology had already talked all about it. Facts are catching up in the 20th and 21st century. My God, ancient prehistoric cultures already told you what was what. But it was shunted aside, laughed off as fairy folk tale and mythology, and we lost such a canon of knowledge by that. And, and we're still reeling from the shock. We're miles behind where we should be because of the negation and the dismissal, you see, of fairy folk, what was, it was laughingly called fairy folk tale. And Ireland's culture is rich in it, one of the richest, and yet we've let it rot to our own bloody detriment. Well, it's great how um, if you have the, for those who have the open-mindedness to go and look into this stuff, there's a whole treasure trove of knowledge there to be had, you know, if you want to go and um, study into it. And um, and what kind of, um, well, just a couple of things for you, what kind of time period are we talking about with Atlantis? And also, um, like, what are the traces of, of the Atlantis story in, in Irish mythology? That's a great question. It's, it's key because the, there's many cataclysms. So when you start opening the door of cataclysm, you immediately have to do exactly as you asked, which is date things, because there's many cataclysms. So the Storega tsunami, which split Norway and Sweden and created the fjords and probably cut them off from islands that were connected to Scotland, that's one cataclysm. Then you have the Bronze Age famine that devastated Ireland about 8,000 BC. The Storega tsunami was about three, 4,000 BC. And the top archaeologists know, the top geologists know, sorry, that that Storega tsunami, Storega just means large in, in Swedish or Norwegian, right? The big, the big tsunami that not only created the fjords, but it sunk a land bridge. So I'm absolutely correct when I talk about a land bridge. It's been seen from satellite now that existed between the remote Orkneys and all of these remote islands, you know, uh, the Isle of Lewis. All of it. Those, those were not islands at one time. You see, our whole picture 
of of Britain and its uh, headlands and its coastlines is utterly, utterly different than it was just a few thousand years ago. Uh, then, then you have the Bronze Age famine. Then you have this and that and the other. But the but these to me are are what you would call follow on effects. They're not original cataclysms. The one that's the biggie, right? The one that sank Atlantis, or if you if you want to get into that, that I think that happened around thirteen thousand five hundred years ago, and that many of the other then subsequent disasters, of which there were many, right, uh, are sort of after effects. The Earth has been so damaged, so traumatized that there's a sequence every three thousand years or so. There's something else going on. But the big one, the one that really matters for tradition, for culture, for you know Western civilization, I think happened. You know, about 13,500 years ago, and I go into that first in the Atlantis book, and then I pick a story up, you know, in the Irish origins and try to make the case then that that's where it starts. Uh, Atlantis is destroyed, you see, or buried beneath the waves, whichever way you want to look at it. And then, just to like the Mayan records say about Atslan, then there's a period of uh, regrouping, regalvanizing culture on the lands that sort of we know today. What this does, if you take it to its ultimate extreme, is it radically changes what we know even about ice ages. So one of the longest, because uh, what we're talking about now can account for that. It can be an alternative account of the ice age in terms of cataclysm, not the uniformitarian, uh, uh, you know, description of it that most school kids know. So there's that angle people can come at, and that's what uh, Richard Milton, you know, uh, people go to my work, they will find them well sourced with people that they can look up. There's a, there's a whole library of books on the Irish origins of civilization website, and one of the books mentioned there is called Shattering the Myths of Darwinism by a man who, though doesn't talk about Atlantis necessarily, has, he's one man, Richard Milton, Shattering the Myths of Darwinism, you see, who's dealt in this alternative view. Then there's Alan and Dallaire, two top professors from Oxford and Cambridge. They don't come any higher than that. Oh, I've got MIT guys, CIT guys from America who've looked into this and found that the story is, is officially given is absolute bogus nonsense, right? So eminent, eminent people. It doesn't mean that you have to believe it on faith just because, you know, they're eminent people, but I, at least I've laid out the information so that people can judge for themselves. And you'll find an incredibly different story there. But as I keep on saying, then the story that you find there and these experts of the modern age, it's confirmed by what the mythology is already, 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 you know, already said about Ireland and and Avalon and Leoness and many other islands that used to be in existence but but are no are no more, you see. And is there a connection between um, you know, the the story of Tiern and Og, which is something that well um well I grew up hearing and I'm sure a lot of people hear that that story, you know, talking about the the land of youth and I mean talking about I think down in um where the Fena used to hang around down in uh, County Clare, I think, or Kerry and about stories of, of them got travelling under the sea to, to Atlantis. Is there any connection between those? Yeah, because uh, these islands, these the blessed islands, the, the fortunate islands, and then these magical islands, all are based in truth. These were islands that were uh, the centers of different cults, right? Because in the Atlantean period, and that's a broad period, we had a different kind of world. Uh, it's also, uh, I've spoken about it in my presentations on what's known as the Arctic homeland. This is another tie-in, which again is about Northwestern Aryan Hyperborean culture. And there wasn't one or two islands, there was many. They're like an archipelagio effect. And each of these archipelagios, which is the real Atlantis, Atlantis wasn't one location, it was an Atlantean culture. And part of that was these different divided lands on which different grades of Druid, let's just put it as simply as possible, existed with their schools. Something that the Christian monks tried to parody later on and didn't quite get it right, but it's an echo of what was before, right? Uh, like Iona and Columba and all of these different, the, 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 the Christian monks were trying to parody it. But the, the original premise was that not only was the Druidic order divided in and of itself, you know, with the Archdruid, the Druids, the Bards, the Ovates, and the Minstrels, something on a horizontal level also was taking place where they had different schools, like the Bards would have a separate set of islands to teach whatever it was that they taught, you know, herbalism, plants, astronomy, you name it. They sectioned things off. It's where our house system comes from when we're dealing with universities and colleges. They're often striated and, and divided into threes. And so we still preserve a great deal of this. In fact, that's a whole sub-study sub in itself. I wrote two volumes on that called The Trees of Life. And those two volumes go into the unbelievable proofs of everything we're saying now, but in symbolism. 
civic symbolism, educational symbolism, royal symbolism, you name it, what symbolism, all the Druidic motifs are right there in plain view. Masonic symbolism, of course, one must always mention that. So yeah, the, the, these islands definitely existed. Uh, they came down through the minstrel tradition and they got all colorful. And then, they, you know, kids hear it and we grew up listening to those colorful tales, but those are now doctored by the minstrel. The minstrels are actually connected to the Druids, but their job was to condense and to popularize high esoteric matters. It's where the zodiac comes from, as we know it, with all the animal figures, you know, to make it easy for people to understand and for farming type level people to get it, you know, uh, almanac level. But behind that is a greater, deeper secrets about, you know, like the Arctic homeland, like the r real uh, truth about the zodiac, the movement of the sun, uh, many esoteric things that, you know, maybe the school of Pythagoras. Uh, there's a tremendous culture in the pre-Diluvian or pre-flood period. And so what we hear about Ocean and Finn and Lou and all the rest of it, you know, an Excalibur, right? The Arthur's Excalibur is based on a prototype, the Irish prototype of the sword of King Nada. So there's a lot that uh, one can extrapolate. Even the suits of the tarot date from this extremely primordial period. And many, many other myths. Uh, David and Goliath was cut and pasted right out of the Irish myth. It's got nothing to do with anything that happened in the Middle East. It's got to do with Lou and Baylor. And uh, you, you don't even have to see. The interesting thing is when somebody gets into this sincerely with an unbiased mind, there isn't much facade to peel off, Emmett, as you well know by looking at it yourself. The, there is a facade you have to peel off, but it's not very deep in many cases. And so there's a lot there that you can find in the Bible. Uh, and there's a lot there that you can find in other myths and legends that are actually based even as far away as India. But they're actually based on something that happened here in the West. Mm, yeah, so yeah, this is kind of where we're getting to the heart of it now, the significance of all of this and the, the, the influence that Irish culture had and how that's kind of been hidden. And I know I'm kind of skipping a lot here. I know we had the cataclysm and, and all that, and that's been covered so much elsewhere. Maybe we could just jump straight into the Druids then, and because I think you brought, up, brought it up earlier, and it's quite key. And um, I mean, I know a little bit about this group. I know they are, they are highly influential and your work kind of uncovered covers that quite a lot. But if we just start with the basics again, for someone who hasn't heard your material before, like who are the Druids and like, how can we um, define them as a group? Well, I think one of the things that I bring to bear is that they were universal. The very word Ireland comes from Aria land. And right there, you immediately now have to expand beyond the shores of, say, Britain, because the Aria are worldwide and that's accepted even by skeptics. So as soon as you start talking Druids as high Aria, you now cannot confine their schools and their colleges to Britain. So automatically, any concept of, you know, Michael's a racist, Michael's a xenophobe, Michael's, you know, an Aryan, uh, talking about Aryans and all that, it just goes out the window because now we're talking high classic traditions. The Aryavarta in northern India and Pakistan, right? The Arya are found in, in Bulgaria, Romania, uh, the steppes of Russia, right? There's not a place where they're not found under one, one name or another, right? So... This group now is linked, the, the key link, that the one I explore the most, it's not the only link, as I say, but the one that is most intriguing to me is a connection with Egypt. So the one thing that people can expand their knowledge of the Druids is that what we call the Amonist tradition, which is a long tradition going back, as I say to King Menes, the worship of Amon Ra is Irish, or Irish, or Aryan, if you prefer. So the, Dru the Druids of, of the West, Northwest, are deeply connected in symbolism and in other fields to the Egyptian Amonists, and may even have founded what we call the Nile civilization. So that's unpacked in 700 pages, you know, in the book, because you can't just say things like that without having at least some thesis, you know, but the thesis is immensely credible. And therefore one, you know, I, I hope that my readers uh, get into it at some point. So that's one thing that can be said is that the Druids are an international priesthood. Then more significantly, a priesthood of what, right? Well, they were solar cult. They were part of a universal solar cult, which had Scythian origins, the Atonists would be a corrupt, uh, they're, they're a branch of these sun worshippers. Of course, as, as when people will read the book, they'll realize we're talking about a corrupt version of solar worship, but that's just one little group, right? Uh, solar worship was all over the world, from the Brahmins to the Jews, to the proto-Jews, you know, the whole world. And then the Druids were the high priests of this solar cult. And their, their temple of wisdom was, you know, what we call Ireland or Arya land. And uh, it was well known. And uh, being of that ilk, it meant then that they had camaraderie right, with 
almost all the nations of the ancient world, not in terms of race, but in terms of caste, right? So when you talk in words that I do, uh, people hear these echoes of, of racial theory. Yes, that's implied, but quickly they discover that it's really nothing to do with that. It has to do with a caste, a spiritual caste, who after the cataclysm tried to preserve whatever there was of the great astronomical wisdom and herbal wisdom and psychological wisdom and all the rest of it, tried to preserve that throughout the world. And that's where you see these common motifs, common motifs in megalithic structures, common motif in the symbol of the serpent, in various other glyphs, in the division into three, which the Amonists always had a tripartite division in their gods, right? Uh, you know, where the, 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 they had the father and the, they had the god and the goddess and the child, this kind of thing, all, bore, all similar to Druidic philosophy, and on and on it goes. And I bring out as, you know, as many of those comparisons as I can. So the Druids are a worldwide order with deep, deep connections to the Scythians, who's pretty much been airbrushed from history. There's so many lies told about them, and to many, many other groups. And the Amonist Druid connection for me is huge. But then the most important thing, the, the bigger thesis of the book is the one that honors Commons Beaumont and honors Conor McDarry. And I pick up their, their meta the thesis, which is that the elements of civilization did not in fact come from Eastern lands like Egypt and India to the, e to the West, as all of history tells us, all the historians, all the history books and all the thinkers that are academic. Well, yes, because it's all lies. Those were, if anything, they were returns. It's not to say that those movements from the East didn't happen, but they happened in much, much later ages. Originally, in the prehistoric era, in the prehistoric epoch, the original movement of the elements of civilization were from the West into the East, and that can be proven. But it's been a lifelong study of mine to find that proof. And one of the most extraordinary ones, just for your listeners, just to throw out one, is mega, the megalithic mile and the megalithic inch, which is used in the construction of ancient sites. Well, it turns out that the finest, most precise measurements done on this Celtic or pre-Celtic measurement that built the, most of the stone circles we know in Europe is found to be in its finer mode, more accurate mode, the further west you go, and it gets more and more corrupt as you move towards the east, which means that the stone circles and megalithic monuments that you find in the eastern lands are far less accurate, you see, uh, and that shows decline. So... The perfect, the perfect version of it is in the West. But of course, I can hear a critic saying, oh, that's because uh, Eastern tribes moving West perfected this measurement you're talking about, Michael. And that's why you find the more perfect version in the West, because it's simple logic to tell you that as they traversed and built stone circles from the West to the East, they got better. Yes, that's nice and that's a nice theory, but it means nothing because they've actually know that the stone circles we're talking about in the West are the oldest. So that the theory falls to the ground instantly. And what happened? Silence. Crickets. When this was finally discovered, that, oh my God, not only are there more perf perfect measurements found in the West, but they're the oldest stones, we had to be silent. Absolute silence fell. So as I say, it's my job to you know resurrect some of these facts, hand them to people un in an un unbiased way and say, what do you make of that? What, what happens to our whole history of the planet if we do indeed just even conceive of the fact that the original elements of civilization, of which there are many, but mathematical ones like we've just mentioned, let alone language or any other music or what have you, originated in the West, moved to the West, East, and then maybe at a later date, after the, the effects of the cataclysm had passed away, the descendants of these original area took it back to the West, and that's where official history starts. So official history starts many stages too late at a time when these traditions were coming back and we have to now realize that that's part chicanery. It's true to a degree, but it omits an infinitely more interesting story. That again, the ancient mythologies are only too happy to confirm that that existed. Maybe we should think at this point uh, again to cater for people who are new to your work and new to whole, this whole story. Maybe we should get into um, what happened in Egypt and how that affected Ireland's development. Because as you pointed out several times, there's been a, the reason why people don't hear about this stuff is because there's been an agenda to kind of wipe it out. And um, would you say it's, it's, it's accurate to say that the reason why the wiping out of this culture happened was because of uh, like a beat? pretty much that that stemmed between the the um the atonists and the Ammonists, and it all started back in egypt yeah i think that's where it started because what we know when we scroll forward from that conflict we come to a key period of irish history which is a little later than the 500 bc moment 
But there, uh, uh, around about that time, we have the coming of the Gales, the coming of the Milesians. This is well known to anyone who's even looked at Irish history briefly. Well, those Milesians are the Atonists. And, and, and the Annals of Ireland confirm that. And the Scottish Chronicon, which is a, the Scottish Annals, confirm it. And they're not the only ones that confirm it either. Even geology confirms this. Digs that have happened in Spain and so on. We could go on at length about this. But you're quite right. The conflict that happened to these uh, Atonists, who I think were descended from the uh, Scythians, uh, was a breach that happened in Egypt of such consequence that its echo effect was taken to Ireland. In other words, the descendants of Akhenaten, after being thrown out of Egypt, made their way back here. Uh, and that journey is known, it's even picked up in the Bible with the story of the Israelites. The, it, it turns up in many areas, but of course the Bible will be the most intriguing account, right? But it, it, it actually happened. And then when these characters got here, they were thoroughly depraved and corrupt. They over They overwrite... They seized the thrones from the uh, other Druidic, proto-Druidic groups that were here. And to me, that is then the fall of the world in, in real terms. In hardened terms, that's when things went wrong and sorcery took the place of magic. And this is a story that's been concealed in the works of Professor Tolkien and the same many other places. Many other mythologies recount this in various colorful ways. Um, even the story of King Arthur is, is very much an account of this. So... Evil comes to the world through these corrupt, but very high. I mean, these are extremely high adepts. They had mystery schools of their own, uh, but they, for some reason, became corrupted. They're worshippers of Set. If you really want to get into it, I do so on my female Illuminati side and other articles that I've, I've tried to lay this out as, you know, as I've gone, because it's an unfolding story. But they're actually kind of worships of Set. So Aton is correct, but it's really Set Aton. There's so much more to this than people could ever imagine. So they're worshippers of darkness, you see. And... Then when you talk about the suppression from the church and from the Jesuits and, and all of that side of it, these are Atonist cabals. These are Atonist cabals. We know them as one thing, but they're really something else. But it wasn't just suppression, was it? That would be bad enough. It was also appropriation. It was also cannibalization. So the very people who suppressed this ancient wisdom of the prehistoric period were happy to magpie it. And that's what you've got. Every single aspect. I bring this out in my book on astrotheology, just to, you know, I wanted to get in deeper to this. But in that book, I show that every single aspect, bar none of what we call Christianity, even if it's in its sanitized version as Protestantism or, or the more elaborate, you know, uh, uh, grandiose aspect of Catholicism, it wouldn't matter. It's all Druidism. Every single part of it. So, you know, and again, that's something that's so controversial. People have to take time. And my work is really only for unbiased people. It's not for the mass audience at all. I've never solicited them. I don't care what they think about it. It's for discerning minds who really are interested in looking at the history of the world, but looking at it as it is a holy work. It's not a history lesson I'm giving. It is a introduction to spiritual truth, which it has an enormous impact on one's own spiritual development. And it's it's very liberating as well, I must say, again, like I said earlier, for those who can actually, um, who can keep an open mind and aren't going to let their emotions sway them into believing one thing or another. And, you know, obviously key to that is being separate, trying to be separate from your background and upbringing and, and do your own research. And, and on that note, um, you know, looking at the connections between Ireland and Egypt in terms of um, like, what kind of evidence do we have of these connections and how far back do they go? And I I know that we've got, um, I know in your work you mentioned King Menes, I think that was 4000 BC and and Skoda as well. And I believe they're both, um, well, they're both buried in Ireland. They are. County Kerry, you can walk right over to it, take a Polaroid snapshot. Yeah, exactly. The daughter of Akhenaten and possibly the granddaughter, if you want to be a little more generous. But either way, or it could even be the ashes of the original queen. We don't know those things for sure, but we know, like I said, if you treat the mythologies as absolute fact, then we have something incredible in front of us. But we also have that in terms of Jeremiah and Tia Tefi over in Navan. Uh, uh, it doesn't just end with the two of them. You know, we have King Menes, as I said. But the one that is, of course, most interesting is the fact that Meritaten herself, Akhenaten's daughter, who made it all the way with King Mil, that was her husband. That's how you get the Milesians and the Gaelic influx. Whoever knew there was an Egyptian tie into that? Well, there was. And then you have Lorraine Evans, a professor of archaeology, uh, her, he, she was blackballed when she found that there was not only evidence of Egyptian ships in England, which had always been habitually been denied, 
And then she found beads, very, very famous beads in Egypt, jewellery found in pits and barrows in England. And her book is called Kingdom of the Ark. It's a good starting place. If people are really, uh, you know, uh, overwhelmed by this, just start with her book if you can get it still. Uh, because I say there's been a, a hell of a campaign of suppression even in modern times. Uh, and she will show you how deep it goes. They found Barbary apes buried in Navan Fort that cannot be explained. And they found Celtic artwork in Egypt. They found cocaine in the, in the tombs of the mummies in Egypt that can only come from South America. They found parrot feathers. And on and on and on it goes. And so there's, there's too much evidence. Archaeological, uh, and I don't know what. You know, but you don't need much more than the evidence of King Manes. You know, and he came down Loch Foil. He was on a ship, and it's because he wanted to come home. At the end of his reign, he goes, I'm going back. And, and the, the, the inscriptions say, I'm going back to the blessed isles of the setting sun in the far west where they knew that civilization had come from. It follows what we said. If, if the fountain of real civilization was in the west, then many eastern peoples would want to visit that and consider that the paradisical isles. Well, that's exactly what they did. And that whole story of Arthur going to Avalon is a replaying of the story of the coming of King Menes, who wouldn't, he didn't want to die before he had seen the green fields of his original homeland, his people's homeland. But, but sadly, as they sailed into Loch Foyle, he got stung by a hornet and died because, you know, it was poisonous. And then he was buried here in Nochmani, uh, the Professor L.A. Waddell. These are people who would take half an hour, you know, to list off their academic citations, just in case there's anyone listening. From Trinity University, any debunker? Yeah. Do you want me to waste the time to cite these men's academic uh, citations? Well, this guy went out there and he took the original rubbings. They're all gone now. They're you know weathered away. Well, the original rubbings have already been taken. And Professor L. A. Waddell, you'll find a page on him in my Irish Origins website. Uh, he wrote books on this. Went to Egypt where King Menes's official tomb, but it was an empty tomb because Menes himself had disappeared, right? And he reconstructed the whole history of that first pharaoh. And the things he discovered, he, he's one of the people that say, when you even say in the word Fenian in Ireland, it actually is a corruption of the word that really refers to the Phoenicians. And then he tells you that story, he wrote a whole book on it. So see, see when you start getting into this, it becomes a life study. And after even like a few weeks of studying this, you have no more time anymore for anything which you've been told by some tour guide at Tara or Newgrange and the babble and the bull crap that they're telling you. You have no more time for any academic sh shit except in a supplementary way because the real story is infinitely more fascinating. Oligarchy comes from Olam, the high druid, right? Aristocracy comes from Arya, the Druids, who were the original spiritual aristocracy. The plagiarization, cannibalization, and rescripting of ancient Druidic lore is permeating our world. Every aspect of Christianity, even Brahmanism, you name it. Egyptology, you can't see these things are right unless you're thinking of the Irish connection. Barry Fell, another professor, uh, epi epigraphic uh, school, top professor in America, discovered Phoenician Irish script. In, in Arizona or, uh, and in places in America, when they dug out the Ohio serpent, a very famous mound, right, of, of an ancient uh, Cyclopean ruin, they're pulling out Irish bracelets, Irish artifacts. I actually knew the guy, Glenn Kimball, who was involved in a lot of that. And he says, we're pulling out torques, Irish torques. When they were in T Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt, 70 Irish torques were discovered. Why, why did that reach the press? Yeah. Because there was a commerce between these people. And you see, to me, there's no, there's no learning curve or, oh, big, you know, furrowed brow when we talk about this dispersion. And when we talk about these interconnectivities between these lands, I have no problem accepting. I don't even know why you would. But it's part of that flat earth mentality. Oh, if you sail too far to the east, or the west, you'll fall off the edge of the world. And people believe that for thousands of years. So we're talking about an incredible campaign of mind control to stop people sailing out, especially independent types until they finally couldn't stop it and it happened. But up until that point, they didn't even want you going to this mystery islands, you know, of the other world where the ghosts and the goblins will get you. Now, why do you think that is? Why do you think the Vatican and other places per pervade that lie? Because they didn't want smart, intelligent, wealthy men sailing out to the island to learn, you know, the truth. Uh, and, th and there's so much that could be said about that because even the Spanish sailors contained the truth about Ireland and they had gone around the... the the British Isles frequently, even despite these bans. And so in their traditions, 
you know, you want to can look into that. There's old theses of looking into what the Spanish and the Andalusian sailors knew about the land of Ireland. It's fascinating reading, actually. Yeah, this is this is big, and there's clues of it everywhere, like you pointed out, and um, it kind of changes your whole um, outlook on the world because everything really ties back into it. And as you pointed out there, the the big organisations, whether you're talking about the Vatican or, or anyone connected in with academia, they don't want people knowing about this stuff because they'll realise that they've been robbed, and that like a lot of these organisations are their foundations of well, they're kind of bastardizations of what went before, aren't they? I mean, they're they're, they're like you said, they're rehashings of old ideas, but these watered down versions of, of atonism and, and stuff like that. That's right. Judaism, Christianity, Masonry. Find me an element in there that doesn't in, either directly or indirectly come from the Druidic tradition, you know, and you won't be able to do it. I've made a life study of this and I'm convinced. And it even goes deeper than what we're talking about. We'll have to, you know, do other interviews in the future that, that go into specific aspects of this, perhaps, if you're into that. But again, just an overview. It's an incredible story. And I think the Arctic homeland, uh, you know, thesis uh, basically is confirmed in mythology that there was a font of all wisdom. There was a decline, a spiritual fall. A garden is involved, as we know in the Old Testament, but that comes from Dillman and some Sumerian scripts. What's it all boiled back to? These are just these are just reiterations of an antitype, an, an archetype that I've you know spent time unpacking. Like I said, the suits of the tarot, for instance, the tarot cards, the four suits, uh, the thirteen treasures of Britain, and 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 so much more. And so one puts it together in as clear a fashion as they can. That's been my life's work to do that in in the Irish Origins site. And in the books, the site is mostly appendices you see to the book because this is an ongoing. My work, my work is not the last word on this. It, it was all dedicated as a kickstart of a subject that had lapsed after the death of people at Commons Beaumont. And my work is a, you know, an attempt to kickstart it, get people's interest in it. Because there's still a lot of lives being purveyed out there by some very, very uh, hostile people in Britain writing books some, on, on some of these, civil, on some of these uh, subjects. But they are extremely territorial. In, in when it comes to knowledge. And they're not in, in any way open to the to the message of somebody like myself when it comes to Ireland. They have a tremendously xenophobic attitude that the truth will actually come out as if it's in some way going to, you know, compromise their own teachings or, and all of that, you know. So there's there's still stuff going on today that's, that's markedly antagonistic to this message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the that's familiar. That that childishness of the establishment and the individuals involved. You know, they're putting their egos before the truth, and and that's what we're up against. And um, just thinking of uh, as well um, to move into the the Christianity topic and the conversion to Christianity. Um, you know, I'm aware that because it ties into the whole what happened with the Druids. There's the official story, and then there's the occulted version, and which you know you've kind of. Done dug out and, and some other um, authors have kind of dug out over the years. So um, what's the difference between the two? What's the official story say about the conversion to Christianity and then what really happened? Well, as I say, Christianity wouldn't exist without this archive. When the Milesian Gales came, after they did their conquest of Ireland, they were very successful. They actually conquered the place. Uh, then a slow, gradual it's like somebody coming to Aladdin's cave. What are you going to do? You're going to start sorting out all the booty, right? So they basically wholesale murdered all the bards. That's one thing. And I mean, a wholesale murder, slaughter. That's why I keep saying it. it's a footnote. But for Jeffrey Keating, one of the greatest Irish scholars, whose book is accepted as an academic classic. Well, it's right in there. What's wrong? It's not Michael DeSarn saying this. That the bards were annihilated. And the reason why they were annihilated in a combination of the Vatican, the papal power, and the, and the autocratic kingly power of Britain, right, is because the bard was the one who preserved the heredity, right, the lineages of all the kings. So all the kings, the kings of Tara, the kings, you know, whoever, the, the chieftains of all of Ireland, all the provinces, and probably this included a lot of Britain and Wales as well, they really didn't know who their ancestors were. They, that was not kind of something that was really foremost on their mind. And the reason was because that was the bard's job. So when the bards were annihilated, it, it cut the cords. It was an act of treason so that the royal families now could be manipulated. I mean, versions of this have happened all over the world, right? But this was one act that the Irish was the prototype in destroying that intelligentsia to disconnect people from their past. That was one thing. Subsequent to that, the Milesian elites, these would be atonists now we're talking about, 
needing to galvanize their power, because after all, these are displaced Egyptians. They don't have an empire anymore, and they want one right back. The world is not enough, as the James Bond movie shows you. And you'd be amazed what those films are revealing if you really know how to you know, decode things uh, symbolically, right? But the world was not enough. And so from Ireland then, from Britain, from the British Isles, they would create a, a new empire in which the sun would never set, Aton, the sun. And that's what you still got going in one perverse version or the other, you know, in the next 2,000 years or whatever, right? But part of that job was the, was the appropriation and the cannibalization of this knowledge. And so Christian, what we know is the Christian monks, some were sympathetic to the tradition, and others were totally antagonistic. But really, that's a moot point as far as I'm concerned, because the damage had been done. And what they did was they systematically, this would have been done through a group called the Chaldees, or the Chaldeans were very much part of this. In other words, Celtic Christianity. Celtic Christianity was left alone by the papal groups uh, so that they could sift. I mean, this Celtic Christian group, if you really know what you're talking about, actually controlled the papal group. They had fallings out later, as all of these psychopaths have. They have rivalries. Uh, but originally, the basic general uh, uh, connectivity between the two was that the papal group in Europe left the, the Celtic church to its own because they knew what was going on. And they had to step back and let it go. And this has been whistleblown in movies like uh, Name of the Rose, you know, by uh, Echo or whatever his name is. But the other, in other words, you know, even, even National Treasure films, even up to more of a recent time, have whistleblown a lot of this. So the cannibalization process took thousands of years. It was slow. It was painstaking. I think they were still doing it up to the Henry VIII and beyond. But to answer your question, what we know as Christianity, as it sifted, as it plagiarized, as it cannibalized, what we know as Christianity grew and grew and grew. And that's why if you go to Vatican City, there ain't anything Christian about the city. It's nothing but pagan stuff all over the damn place. There's nothing negative with it. It's just that's, that's the fact of the matter. So the Christianity we know today, the bishoprics and the clergy and the, the, all of the... All of the uh, I'm thinking here of the regalia, the pomp and ceremony, the uh, calendar dates of uh, which certain celebrations are done, all sorts of, you know, all the traditions are based in this cannibalization, right? And so there's deep, deep connections. And I've written, like I say, Trees of Life and then this book on astrotheology to tease those out even more. So, you know, just to fill out the case and to provide evidence of this. And uh, so many words like re, right? Ard re, high king. Well, well ra, in our, in, in, you have ra the high king, the high god over in Egypt, you know, and so on it goes. So the connections are actually very interesting. And there's a whole, if you go to the Irish Origins of Civilization website, there's an appendix section which starts with a thing on Druidic symbolism. It's in three parts. And people can just look at that. It's all free. They can go there and they can, and there's other pages as well, which explores this symbolism and how a lot of it, uh, oh, one group we didn't mention that was deeply connected to the Druids. I mentioned the Egyptians and the Scythians. The other group of paramount importance is the Persians. Not the Persians as Islam, you know, which happened again 600 AD. Look how late we're talking now. But I'm talking about the actual Persian, the lost Persian Magi, the, the three Magi who turned up in the nativity. That's what I'm talking about. They're Druids. And the treasures that they brought uh, are three again. There's that old Druidic number. And so it goes. So the Druids of Ireland and Britain were de and Scandinavia were deeply connected to the Persians, who was actually an Aryan tradition, a high Aryan tradition. And their kings like Xeres and Darius... Right, Darius, think of the name. It has the etymology of Arya in it. And inscriptions found by the Persian king said, I am he who of the great Arya. It's mentioned right there. And you'll often notice that in Sumerian Babylonian uh, depictions, right, you see the king holding the little basket. People wonder what that little thing is he's holding. It looks like a little, you know, case or basket that he's holding. That's seeds to plant the holy tree. Just as the Druids did, they were tree worshippers. And the Persian king was always shown to carry the little basket, you know, because he was a, he was the keeper of the tree. So every one of the Persian and Babylonian Sumerian traditions are Druidic. They're from the West. And in my books, I prove that. Absolutely, hands down, prove that. And the lies we've been told about when people try to reverse it to make it look like that maybe Western culture was based on the Sanskrit or based on the Hindu or based on the Persian, you know, and it's all lies. But, of course, it's something that comes also with a lot of mind control in it and a lot of entrainment. And if, if you've never been put on to these great sages of the past, well, you'll just bite down on whatever, you know, Big Brother tells you to believe. And that's what's happened. 
do you think as well that's why um, just to kind of zoom out and look at Ireland and the history of it as a whole do you think that that's perhaps why it seems that the you know obviously the British crown and, and the ruling types seem to have been so hard on, on Ireland it wasn't just of course yeah they, they you know had the land and they used the food and the resources to feed the army and all that stuff but I think maybe at the top of the pyramid they were quite happy to keep the Irish suppressed and to you know bring Christianity in and use the church to control as well uh, as, as well as the military to, to kind of completely stop the you know the stamp out entirely any sort of you know of the Irish culture or genetics or, or the druidic th- teachings you know to stop it kind of um, being a threat in the future yeah they're very worried uh, when you talk about a fountainhead of knowledge it's active even if it's covered over by th- you know 100 feet of concrete uh uh, 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 you know, the, the grass can still throw, grow through the cracks. And so having completely dominated Ireland and having created their world empire, what we're living in now is the Atnast Empire. But it, but the taking of Ireland was a key aspect. See, these Atnasts actually went back to Scythia first. They went to Spain. That's, you know, the, the Milesians crossed over from Spain. That one's kind of known. But a lot, but they actually went to Scythia first. This is less known. And they weren't allowed back in. They were so corrupt that their Scythian ancestors wouldn't let them in. And there was a, pretty much a battle. It wasn't a war, but it was a really good tussle between Briogan, I think his name was, uh, one of these Atnas from Egypt who went try to get back and ingratiate himself. And he wasn't accepted any more than when they first came to Ireland. A guy called uh, If wasn't accepted. Now, they killed him on the site, right? So when I said earlier that it was an easy takeover, yeah, it was bar one incident. Their first arrivals... Uh, you know, the Milesian king was, uh, or the Milesian agent was immediately killed. Uh, and then and then later on, the takeover took place. But they know that when you have a soil so rich as what you have in Ireland, it's the font of all culture, it could rise again. So this is a pet, you know, like Spectre with his white cat, right? Groom it, stroke it, feed it, keep it under surveillance because this country could produce wonders. So what do you do to stop that happening? You create mayhem. You create blood of the Irishman. You wave something in his face. Revolution. Freedom. Liberty for all, right? And they know that the Irish spirit is aligned to truth. But they have a... Ma- what, what I call them sorcerers, you want to know why I do that? What, do you think that's a joke? That's something borrowed from fiction? They know what the Irish spirit is capable of. It's built the world. It built America. It built Canada. For goodness sake. So you have to use a particular kind of uh, magic, sorcery would be the better word, to keep these people drunk through alcohol. And the symbolism on the alcohol is my, as a study in itself. You've got to keep them brainwashed in Jesuit colleges, worshiping Jesus. Yeah, the sun, yeah, the Druidic sun king. Yeah, let's talk about that. Aesus, Dionysus, right? Yeah, oh, shit. The thing is happening today. Then on top of that, add this fact that these people being psychopathic from these uh, prehistoric periods have had many conflicts and rivalries in amongst themselves. So when we pick up the history of Ireland as it would go from the Chaldean church, right, the Christian church, then we have the conflict between the, the Christian church in Ireland, the Celtic church and the papists, right? Then that's on paper. We have the Merovingian conflicts. We've got the, uh, we've got the later conflicts with Adrian, uh, you know, and, and the takeover of Ireland. Then we've got Cromwell. You see, all the way down, it's been nothing but infightings of the same group. Now, if, if you're looking too close to the canvas, it all looks like different groups. And, and it looks like pretty much what we accept the official history to be. You know, the British crown intervening, the Protestants coming, the Catholic, all the stuff we know, that's what it looks like when you're stuck up right against the canvas. When you pull back a little bit, you realize, oh my God, it's the same cults fighting under different guises. So masonry has a stranglehold here. The Jesuits have a stranglehold here. And they've had it for a long, long, long time. Other, uh, even more shady, I talk about the female Illuminati. Let's not get into that right now. But there's even more sinister uh, goings on in Ireland. To keep the place suppressed, to keep the Irishman shedding his own blood or the, that of his brothers, you see, which then has a very important geomantic effect. We could get into so many other subjects connected to, uh, you know, how this works on even ritualistic levels, the designs of cities. I mean, just enormously interesting aspects that are satellite subjects to trauma and how uh, consciousness is kept on a very low primitive level and how a very high culture, an immensely high culture, can be brought low in an extraordinary falling off 
It's, it's it's really something that you know has intrigued me for many years how this how this has happened. Yeah, and it's uh, you know unfortunately um, it's not easy for people to see unless they're dedicated and they're willing to just rise above the brainwashing. And I mean, even what we're talking about now, people would say, "Ah, oh, well, sure, it's the ancient past." What what? And how is that important when we've got all this stuff like, you know, geopolitics, mass migration, et cetera, et cetera. And it's extremely important because uh, what we're talking about is the destruction of culture, the, the erasing of history and also the erasing of identity, which is what keep, keeps you safe from harm in the present. And as your work has pointed out and many other alternative researchers have pointed out, when you, when you lose your um, when you lose your identity, you can't defend yourself from control and you can be moulded into whatever they want you to be in the present. And I mean, you know, the, the chaos that's spreading around the Western world now with the, the monoculture, they call it multiculturalism, but it's a monoculture, you know, all of that boils back down to this ancient stuff so that there's parallels isn't, isn't there it's it's all about control really yeah well said and and that uh, original um, blueprint of destruction that happened here in ireland they've then rolled that out across the board you know uh, uh, they, that was the blueprint and then they said okay now we can do this here 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 you know, the, the old idea, even during the First World War, of putting very antithetical peoples and tribes beside each other, knowing that as time goes by, this is going to foment destruction. Well, the British crown, the British elite, and they're not British, by the way, uh, but the black nobility, the black lodge, they have then repeated this formula because it works so well. It works so absolutely well that the descent, see, it's, that one of the descent is through the Merovingian, the, the, the so-called French, they're not even French. The French Merovingians are the origin of the Dutch royal family. And the, they tried to break the chain by conversion religiously. They were in France, they were Catholic, but then they in Dutch, when they moved to Holland, they became Protestants for all that's worth. And then they moved to be the British crown. They gave rise to the Hanoveran dynasty that uh, the present queen and her filthy spawn are part of. And they have no allegiance to Britain, Holland, Germany, or France. This is a globalist internationalist black lodge that is absolutely infested the West. But again, these are people who have plagiarized, right? The coronation of the queen. I did a thing on the coronation of the queen, which shows all these Druidic elements and ominist elements, right down to the rings that she's wearing and the staff that she holds, the scepter, and, the, and even some of the words that she chant, you know, is told to recite and all the rest of it. The whole thing is utterly Druidic. Uh, that can be found on the Unslaved website. So this, they've rolled out this mechanism of uh, control. It's Faustian, it's Machiavellian, and it will work again and again and again until we wake up, you see, and, and step past this, uh, this uh, programming. And that involves understanding trauma. So my work always goes to the past, not because I'm a historian per se, but because I'm interested in uh, psychology and how modern mechanisms of control, right? Uh, modern architecture of control could not exist without them knowing us psychologically, that we're deeply, deeply traumatized. And that trauma is what they have done in the past, but it's also this physical cataclysm that they're making use of. They co-opt that. They co-opt the, co the fact that in their stratagems, man has been traumatized by actual celestial, you know, uh, terrestrial cataclysm. That played in to the hands of the deceivers and the sorcerers. So, so then when we talk about the countermanding action, it has to be one of healing. And then, the, well, then when you turn to say, okay, I accept that, how do I heal? Well, again, crickets. Who's out there dealing with ancestral trauma? There's not even one person in this movement of which I am a member, so-called, uh, whatever the hell it's called, alternative research community, it used to be actually, you used to actually be worth that name. Now it's not. But even on a better day, well, who's dealing with this, this concept of trauma? Not a single one. And yet you cannot break, right, the iron hand of control now, let alone the public consensus trance or anything else. It's just, it's, it's simply impossible. It's, it's, it's no more possible than a man on crutches, right? You kicking away his crutches and saying, walk. No, he's on those crutches for a reason because he's disabled, physically disabled. Well, when you understand that you're psychologically and emotionally disabled, then obviously you can't have sovereignty. You will not have peace. You will not have stable, sane socio-political structures or a worship until that's all. Otherwise you'll be clinging. What you'll do is be leaning. You'll be using handrails. All the religious structures, the scientific structures, the institutionalized structures are there to hold you up. And that's where we are right now. 
But we're learning to walk on our own with sanity, with religion and, and, and science that makes sense, we're not even close. And anyone who's come up to help us get there, like a Walter Russell or, you know, bring back some of these incredible visions of the universe, you know, Victor Schauberger and many others, oh, shoot them. Just shoot them down. We don't want that. So corruption is oozing, you see, from every source. And whoever's corrupt, salute, we follow. We're in immediate lockstep with the demagogue. But the sage, hang him. Yeah, the, the um, and it's just uh, this the way the world is right now, and it's been like that for quite a while, and, and now there's so, so many other areas we can go into, and the the kind of the the cult like um, what you call it, so called progressivism or liberalism, say just to focus on Ireland for a moment, but also the Western world, but it's happening here too, and um, this is becoming the new religion, you know, but but as as those of us who can see it for what it is, now it's uh, um, it's just another aspect of control that's now um, making people not think and I know it's getting complex here but um, and uh, but anyway just to conclude I don't want to keep you too long here Michael I could talk to you all day and I think that we should uh, we should probably do more and because we skipped over quite a lot and I think it's important for people to know um, this material you know, because there's a lot of people concerned about how things are gone and, and all that stuff. But as you pointed out, you got to know about um, the human psyche and about manipulation before you can actually go and make a real difference. That's essential. It's been an essential aspect of my work and it's fallen largely on deaf ears. Not altogether. You know, I always, uh, there's a very, very, very small percentage who get this. Uh, and everybody else is just the packing in the case to, to leave out consciousness, right? I mean, what do you think the high druids taught? What do you think the mystery, mystery school tradition is? And yet we have been educated by the foulest creatures with the foulest ideologies, materialism, atheism, you name it. And even when it's in the name of religion, what have you got? It's despicable. And these institutions of evil still exist with our complicity today. That thing over in the Vatican, people are buying and scraping at that or whatever you've got. It's emaciated. It's anemic. And there's so many deceivers then that when people go, oh, I know I agree with you, Michael, I left that. Yeah, to go what? To the New Age movement? Or into some uh, power-hungry masonry? You know, they've covered all the... They've covered all... They've got their brigands and they've got their highwaymen covering every road to get you to be into another partisan clique, you know, uh, have another pillow fight so you can't get into this group because now you're rival to that group. You know, and this is in, done in subtle ways or it's done in extreme ways, right? So I've always talked about studying evil, the anatomy of evil, right? If, if you want to be on the good side, you have to then thoroughly know your enemy as, as thoroughly as they know you and, of course, even more. But that is a holy work. That's not just some intellectual, I'm bored. You know, wh what kind of books are on the, in the shop window right now? What's on, the, what's on the bestseller list? Are you kidding me? It takes devotion of the monk it's lonely work. It's very hard. It, you, you're going to instantly be against your family people, family members, and the lads at the pub. You'll be on your way to wisdom. There's no question that you will know that you are wise and that you're climbing the mountain. And as every step you go, you're getting greater and greater vista into the whole. Yeah, but that has its own weight, right? It has its own uh, ter terribleness about it. And I, I really don't think that a lot of people, in fact, what I see is distraction from it. A lot of the idioms that are thrown up in our world today are to either offer further more distractions to people who claim to be seeking the truth. But, you know, as Schopenhauer and others knew, yeah, so what do you want to pay for that truth? Well, not you don't want to pay, pay, in, pay in blood. You want it easy. So then the publishing houses, right, uh, uh, will give you watered down versions, the History Channel, will offer you endless titillating, always ending with questions, questions, questions. So I mean, what's going on? All these millions of dollars and still we're asking questions at the end? Why, why are they not ended? You know why? Because they won't touch a Commons moment. They won't touch any of the people I'm talking about. They will not deal with the real story. So of course you're bound to have more and more questions. So, but, but it's like the carrot and the stick thing. You know, in, in our, in our uh, Architects of Control, in my Architects of Control film, I have this character, you know, Monty Python leading you through the streets up into a blinking field with nothing on it. Well, that's what academia is today. That's just keep on, you know, posing the question. Round and round we go. They will not give us answers. And we are not demanding them. And so that's why life goes by. 
And, you know, you have to pick up the slack on your own basis. I mean, we should have learned this in school. But unfortunately, the people who are into what I'm doing have had to say, oh, my God, I've been lied to. So, you know, it's like the great Lloyd Pye say, everything you know is wrong. Well, I didn't, I didn't invent that. I don't want it to be that way. But I've had to pick up the slack and have a monumentally torturous journey to the truth that I know now. Well, then why don't, you know, what? I can't then turn around and say to the other person not to embark on the same thing. It becomes ludicrous to say that. What I can do is make it easier. So in my work and my websites, that I can do, to present a life study, right, uh, for people. And also not, not only that, but a synthesis of, of thousands upon thousands of other works, you know, experts, what they've had to say that may contribute. And to put together this collage, uh, you know, and many of these books come from many, many centuries ago. So then I'll, I'll sort of uh, redact those books and, and take the essence of them and make them more simple for, to make the whole process easier. But that's all I can do. And I want to see that it's of use. So, yeah, but, but at the other side, you have to then accept that there's no mass awakening going to be taking place. This is, I've never thought of that anyway, but just to make it doubly clear, this is a work that you pick up reverently because it's deconstructive and apophatic. And it's a whole, involves a whole different kind of thinking than the one that we're taught about. And that most people, you know, when they say they have knowledge, they've got it through a, a very, very different acquisitive process, not through deconstruction. That's a very, very different kind of process of learning that involves psychology, uh, speculation of the enemy, trying to look through the keyhole, trying to fathom what they're doing, how they work. It's very, very different uh, level of insight uh, and intuitiveness that is required, always backed up with facts. See, so on one hand, you're doing the intuitive work or with imagination and speculative work, and the others you try to keep up to date with modern discoveries, and like I say, these National Geographics, I, I meticulously record that. So when people go to any of my websites, it's all right there. It's all been meticulously placed there, all these discoveries and links, you know, so that people can follow up every single word I'm saying. Nothing is said. Nothing is said without citation. Nothing is said without uh, links so that people can follow it up on their own and say, oh, where did that come from? You know, and, and again, Go to the site, irishoriginsofcivilization.com. They'll find a reading list there and they'll find just copious links to follow so that uh, you'll ultimately be led to great thinkers before our time, you know, people whose names should be revered and people who are the true teachers that we should be bringing up the next generation to learn from so that the picture of our, you know, our world and these individual lands you know, is made much, much clearer than it is right now. And that will in itself then create an interest that hopefully will ameliorate the need of young people to get involved in sectarian activity. You know, because myself, I'm talking about studies I were doing right in the middle of the troubles, right there in South Belfast, that affected every aspect of our lives. People were shot in our street, bombs, you know, the whole thing, right in the middle of Belfast, in the middle of the troubles. And there's me going around with a magnifying glass, looking at all the Masonic symbolism, which is extraordinarily you know, prevalent in Ireland, but even doing more, even doing ge ge uh, geomancy, taking measurements of all, a lot of what I'm doing now, you know, the seeds of it were planted way back then in the early 80s, for goodness sake. So, that, you know, how many people do you know who commit to that length of study with no reward? And do you think as well that's what's required? Because in a way, um, hard, hard as it is to say, because obviously I'm sure you've noticed, of course you've noticed that the control system is now almost um, chucking more stuff at people and the consciousness of people because um, there, I think the internet has kind of started to level the playing field in the last couple of decades, especially the last say, 10 years or whatever. And the control system is chucking stuff at us, more distractions, more mind control, um, you know, the neo-Marxism, the political correctness, the the global um, the migration pacts, the, uh, the the centralized government stuff, and I think that to get us out of this mess. That's what we need is people who are really dedicated and who are need to, they need to be broad individuals, not just up to speed on politics, but they need to know about culture. They need to know about their own culture. They need to understand themselves as individuals as well. And and also you got to understand the nature of the enemy. <laughs> that's important as well, isn't it? Yes, that's key important because a lot of the identification that we have has been construed by them. There is a, you know, a, our roots, our true roots, but unfortunately there's been so much uh, skewing and uh, twisting of that as well. So then when we find we, I've got these national beliefs or I've got these racial beliefs, 
Most of them are impure. They're not even correct anymore. And so there, there's many, many uh, tentacles to this. So the consensus trance is the safety zone in which people say, you know, I, I've grown up with this traditional background and I'm sticking to it hard and fast and I'll fight tooth and nail to keep it, thinking that they're doing something virtuous. So we're already talking about independent minds and outsiders. I started off years ago talking about that and it's the same today. I have you know, never, ever preached to any choir. Not interested. I've never advertised myself. And even in the moments when I've done it, it's only been in very select moments for a very select purpose. We're, we're, I've even, this year, like just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, we, we came off social media, right? Uh, YouTube specifically. And we've totally toned down uh, social media interaction. I barely put a comment, one half a line a month, you know, and, and it has to be bloody justified for that. I'll still do posts because they're relevant, but we are, we're down to like, a, you know, 10% of what we used to do when it came to social media. Couldn't care less. We're only interested now in, you know, we've made the websites available. There's a lot of free material there. And uh, that's it. That's all we can do because of what you talk about. That a thing that started off very positively, which had the aura of true libertarian, you know, freedom about its freedom of speech and so on, has been completely dominated by the fascists who are the real, the reds, the socialists. And in many ways, the only thing that's good that's happening is because of the utter hypocrisy of these people who behind a socialistic veil are now acting in a monstrously fascist way. Hopefully, a certain very important demographic, mostly people in the middle, can now start to see what's going on and see the chicanery. And so, you know, sometimes we hold up mirrors to that as well, the worst offenses in our, in our work, and, you know, so that people can see some of that and have guests on who talk about that. Because it's very, very important, not for extremists, they'll never change. But there's a certain unbiased group that normally sits on the fence. Those, those people are now vitally important in the future of Europe. And we're already seeing evidence that they're getting it. They're getting what's been going on. And then in, in my programs, we even bring other elements that are never dealt with, you know, with other, by other anyone else in this movement. Subjects like, say, Islamo-communism, which is a huge piece that needs to fit in. How two hydras of, you know, they become bedfellows after the Second World War. And I bring on the great experts who have written and uh, who know that subject through and through. But again, that's a very, very uh, small piece. And yet it's one of the most important pieces to decode what is happening. Uh, I've written, you know, on the papacy and, and all of this. So there's, there's a lot of good work out there. But as you say, there's tremendous distraction. There's so much static and noise. And, you know, it, 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 that's why I go on very, I, I do baby two radio, radio shows a year. And when you contacted me, I was just absolutely overjoyed, you know, to see the work that you're doing and the level of intelligence, because I only now will go on radio shows publicly. I just, you wouldn't believe the ones I've just turned down this week. I mean, big, big primetime stuff, right? Well, don't want nothing to do with it. You know, so uh, I'm hit up all the time by these creatures and just, you just no chance. Their last guest was a stripper. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can't wait to come on there with your millions of viewers. What the hell? What do I want with that? So, you know, I'd rather talk to people like yourself who are well-meaning, you know, studying seriously, thinking about things deeply, and then trying, as you say, to go to the next step and bring it to the world through a podcast or, you know, a blog or a piece of writing. I mean, that, that's, that's it for me. I have no other pretensions at all. I watch them come and I watch them go and I still carry on doing what I'm doing. Yeah, well, th thanks very much for the compliments there, Michael. It's greatly appreciated. And, you know, uh, it is all about kind of um, quality. And I suppose after being on, on the... Uh you know, on, on your own journey for all these years doing the work that you do. Um, like, the you know, I'm struggling with myself sometimes over the last few years being involved in petty conversations or, or, or kind of um, stuff that's more low consciousness is just frustrating, you know, because we don't have time for this stuff. That There's much deeper things that needed to, to be discussed here. And um, we were talking about, you know, we just briefly touched on the stuff that's happening nowadays. What I see, and I'm sure you've noticed this as well, from my personal opinion, one of the scariest things that's happening nowadays is that people are being warped morally 
you know, they, they don't know the difference between right and wrong because of the, the ideologies, you know, the, the Fabian socialist style takeover of Ireland, you know, the last few decades that's now in front of everybody's faces and they can't see it. And everyone's talking about diversity and equality and, and you're kind of looking at people going, where did you get these ideas from? You know, they're, they're just ideologies. That's the scariest thing that, that's, that's kind of, I've noticed. And the, you know, to tie it back into what you're we talking about, that there is an ancient way wisdom and the knowledge there for us but it's been pasted over so much and now people are becoming these I hate to say it but they're almost like half people you know they're they're, they're not really there and um, you know we are in a war of sorts and I suppose we just have to keep putting the information out there and inspiring people to 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 just find themselves and just snap out of it yeah you're right well said they've become a victim of the sludge culture which has been boil a frog. It has been, it's been uh, foisted on them over time through these idiot uh, sitcoms, which have given them all the memes to which they're obsessively glued. You see, so the, the neighbors and Brookside and Coronation Street and Emmerdale and EastEnders and all that shash, and they bloody followed it uh, because you know you've been denuded spiritually. You know, libraries are closing. As I say, sages are pilloried. False leaders and demagoguery. As I said, we get into lockstep behind the demagogue because there's all sorts of other big daddy psychology, power struggle psychology involved. And I've gone into that in my Dragon Mother thesis, you know, about why this destabilization takes place, when it takes place, and what are the consequences of it. And a great deal of it has to do with, you know, our dislike of getting older, you know, uh, uh, our dislike of entering into the solar world where, our, where it, it demands us to be inventive and to use our reason. And Big Brother, the nanny state, the Fabian socialists, as you say, they have made it that you don't need to. You can remain on an infantile level. Big daddy, big nanny will take care of you. It's communism light, as you correctly correctly noted. And so it's not the Bolshevik ty- type of hard boot in the face communism. The Fabians always warned the Bolshevik leaders that that wouldn't work, and they were right. This is the Marcusean aspect. This is the Fabian version, right? Socialism with a smile that they realize that affluence will be the biggest leash, not, not the boot in the face like they tried in the iron, you know, behind the Iron Curtain countries. That didn't work. That just, in the end, up the people threw them over. Well, they don't want that now. They don't want to be thrown over. And they're not going to be thrown over because they've offered you affluence. The very things that after suppressing cultures for centuries economically, they now give you, you know, smartphones and big screen TVs. And tomorrow it'll be cars that drive themselves or whatever else, you know, headsets where you never have to leave the virtual reality world. And all and on it goes. In other words, it's all escapes from selfhood, escapes from listening to my, the voice of my own emotions, uh, listening to the dark voices within my own head, you see, well, more happy pills. So when it, we've been talking here the majority of the time about ancient history. As I've said on other time, at other times, my in- interest in ancient history is spawned by a deep abiding interest in what's happening right now. So it's not like a normal person who'd say, I love history. I'm interested in in all the dynamics we see today, be it in terms of gender, be it in terms of politics, be it in terms of religion and race, right? The colonel was what I learned on the streets of Belfast, but my God, look where it's gone. But it all boils down to the fact that unless you understand ancient trauma, you can't understand how the cowboy and the sheepdog, you know, whip that herd of cows and steer. It steers the steers. It steers them in a certain direction with a single, single crack of the whip. How is that possible? So then it's the Orwellian control, right? Which is far more and more sophisticated than the old Balchi, you know, regimented thing. That was one incarnation of it. They realized their mistake. And so they set up the f- institutes like the Frankfurt School, you know, and they had many dissenters as well. There's certain great thinkers there who didn't go along with the gig and truly were more humanitarian. But the core of it said, hey, we've got to co-opt this feeling of ancient trauma. And that means we've got to have wars and rumors of wars, perpetual headlines of disaster and chaos, even when there isn't going to be any. And we have to have the, you know, as as Albert Pike said, unleash the nihilists. What he meant was unleash the headlines. Trade unions on strike again, war in the Gulf, tsunamis, atomic blasts in Fukushima, and all the crime in our streets, right? The feral kids, the economic frauds, internet insecurity. And we just say, have you got a key and a lock? 
And you got a little safe space for me called my life, called, called Western. That's, that's Western culture. And I just lock myself in. I don't want to know. So it's like one of these Charles Bronson apocalyptic films where the, the fucking crimos are just hopping the fences and running over the walls, burning the city. And while everybody just sits inside and turns up the TV as large as they can get it. Cowardly, docile, fat, weak, right? inebriated by Coke and sugar and cigarettes and booze and happy pills, anything to suppress the natural intelligence. That's the chaos. Where's the heroism in that? It doesn't exist in the West. And so absolutely, we will now want to pattern ourselves on some Middle Eastern, you know, uh, semi-savage pattern right out of the past. And if it wasn't that, it'd be something else. Because the, the roots of our own culture have been so utterly torn up. But I believe, you see, that you must study that process because there's a tremendous spiritual reasons for doing so. Because it is, after all, evil. And no person can say they're good unless they know the nature of evil. It just, there's no other equation. You can't break that equation. Any other pretensions towards goodness is just nonsense. Real ethics, real morality, as Immanuel Kant and other people said, you've got to know 100% what are the origins of it. And one of the origins of morality is freedom. All right, now we're talking about freedom. What is that? Well, that's the, that's the hallmark of the creator. The creator gave you the essence of what he is, which is the freedom to do evil, the freedom to do good. But I'm giving you the complete freedom because there's no coercion involved in a true spiritual connection with the source. So the essence of why you're moral, right, is because you've been given a gift of gifts, the very thing that spirit has as its essence, which is freedom. Now, you can do freedom to create, freedom to, to uh, fight pathogens, you see, to be immune, or no, just sit on the couch, turn on the TV and, and drift off into some delta waves, you know, passively accepting the flow of history, the flow of politics, the flow of what, uh, you know, the Labour Party or the Conservative Party or the Pope or whoever, you know, points in the direction of, you just go along with that. That's fine. I, I'm no problem. I'm not going to fight that. The sad thing about it is that people are, you know, and for for those of us who understand how the control system works and understand how the occultists, you know, the, the puppeteers, how they work is that they like to get people to mess themselves up using their own free will. So it's beyond, like you said, the old uh, boot in the face type of communism or, or oppression where, you know, it's machine guns running in with the machine guns. Now it's a different tactic. They, they condition people to, to not want to, to be free and, and to actually convince them, you know, that they should enjoy the, the prison cell. So they, you know, it's, it's a whole new way of, of, of doing it. That's, it's actually quite very effective. Yeah, they've triggered in, they've, they've, they've uh, bought into the idea that we want freedom from freedom. And we really do want that. So then they say, well, let's provide it. Now, what this does, of course, is it says, okay, that doesn't exonerate these leaders for doing what they're doing. But as I've said from day one, what is the slave doing uh, to reciprocate? What, what, what role is he playing in the master-slave dynamic? Well, that's it. That's it. Your hinter landed. You are immediately give, given a ticket to Hinterland. Get out of town by noon. We don't want to see you here, around here, Michael. That's psychology, mate. That's getting to the root of it. No, I'm, I belong to the, 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 the uh, you know, the Occupy movement. I'm an anarchist. I'm fighting back. My guns are hidden. And I'm looking at them going, oh my God, is that is that what we're talking about? And America specifically is one of the most anti-psychological places on earth, but unfortunately everywhere has followed. It used to be traditionally a very anti-psychological place. They've tried and every single other fix, but it never strays far from say a sort of quasi-religious or a political, you know, sort of strategy. There's just an absolute resistance, cognitive dissonance against psychology. And unfortunately that now has gone across the board. And if we're not very careful, even the most generic one-on-one level of Freudianism, Jungianism, I don't know what ism, in a psychological sense, is going to be completely forgotten or totally misconstrued. It's already being misconstrued. Some of even the most basic primitive stuff of what these men talked about. You know, I did. I had to do a whole series on auto rank, and of course, and even on Thomas Zaz and these people. And it's very much uh, spiced with a lot of the, you know, the Freudian stuff to bring it back to say this is very valuable information. It has a lot of appeal, and we can't let afford, afford this to fall through the cracks. You know, because it, losing these great tools of, of decipherment and self-analysis is exactly what Big Brother wants. And so, you know, my work is very heavily psychological and philosophical uh, for that reason, is because we can't afford to lose these tools. Then we've really lost something valuable in the West. 
Psychology is so valuable. It's far more valuable than religion, you know, or, pol or politics. And so when I see a lot of people running around well-meaning in these different, uh, you know, parties, be they on the right or whatever, but I can see that they're painfully collectivistic and painfully uh, anti-psychological. How, how can you have faith in any of that, you see? But again, I don't go and force it down their throats. I present the work there and these different articles and websites, and it's up for, the, for those people to come along. But, but when you've understood fundamentally that the vast majority of people want freedom from freedom, now you understand why an architecture of total tyranny over the Orwellian brand you know, it exists today and is likely to stand forever. Mm, yeah, the the solutions. I mean, um, you know, the, the the fact that people there's so much fear, and, and we've talked about the the lethargy or the the slobbish kind of culture and all that. I wonder if there's a connection there where they're happy for us to to be to be in our pampered comfort zone all the time, because then the idea of even the the most simple spiritual act of rebellion. Or, or maturity is to pay attention to your own emotions, to understand the self, to accept your strengths and weaknesses. Like that's the core of of psychological development, and you know that that's the foundations upon which you can start to build a real rebel personality who can you know affect changes out in the world around you. And the more we have a society where people are you know these um, you know Facebook um, photo likes, you know the more people are or you know social media, the more they're addicted to pleasure. And the Pavlovian sort of stuff, you know, the more they're addicted to all of these um, comfort zones and simple little pleasures, I think really um, it's making you into a weak spiritual person. And then you just book in the end, you just become like another kind of um, person who's no threat to the system at all. Well said. I agree 100 percent with that. That's what your soy boy culture is. You see, you live on the social media. You don't have to have eye contact. You don't have to have one-to-one -one deep emotional connections with anyone. There's no availability, really. It's just a digitized availability, superficial. All the ideologies and the demagoguery, you know, the crowd becomes a surrogate womb in which you can become infantilized. And so your pleasures are, you know, of a four-year-old. And this goes for adult people. It's okay if you're four years old. It's not good if you're 40 years old. So the, the classic infantilization, which the Frankfurt School, we have it in their own documents, for goodness sake. Herbert Marcuse was basically an orgiast. He was basically a hedonist, right? At, at the end of his life, he didn't sign off on communism. He still was a card-carrying Marxist, but he had had mixture. You see, he had, he had put in so many other elements that didn't exist when Marx wrote his work. Uh, but one of the admixture was just pure satanic hedonism. He actually advocated it to his te to his to his pupils in the school and wrote wrote on it that basically, guys, I'm a satanist which is not, not in the spiritual sense, but in the orgiastic, I'm seeking pleasure, let, 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 the, uh, let the carnival begin. And a lot of the teens at that time, the 20-somethings listening to this of a socialistic persuasion, signed on and they went out to be the Germain Greers. They grew up to be the leaders of society. Now, now do you know why we have a culture of child abduction and pedophilia and orgy, orgyism all over the planet from corner to corner? Because they, it was ideology. It was told to the socialist groups, this is all right to live for pleasure. There is no God. There is no afterlife, right? There's no there's no uh, purpose or spiritual meaning in anything. So just, you know, as you say, live decadently. Live for even the smallest pleasures. And that's a life without purpose and meaning. You know, Nietzsche called it decadent. You either, you either decadence or nihilism. Nihilism is in the man who did have a belief system, a deep one, but then he found out, you know, it, that's no longer sustainable. Those values don't work. So he becomes completely nihilistic. He doesn't believe in anything. But he, at least he had in his core one time a belief system. A value system would be a better term. The decadent guy just goes, I don't even know what that means. And he's just out for fun and kicks. And, and Nietzsche said, that's what you can have. And that's exactly what we have. And the strange thing about it is that even in when some people say, oh, but I am religious. Yeah, but are you really? Or is that religion a decadent move? Have you got into it because it's new age movement and you you chum up with your little friends? You see, you know, and all this nonsense. Is it really personal to yourself? Are you on a personal journey? Or is it just clubbing up with a bunch of new age nutballs and talking about, you know, remote viewing or, you know, when are the angels coming to save us all and all this shite that went on, you know, for since the 70s. I was very deeply involved with people who were in this movement. So I know it through and through. And even though it's not all together, 
you know, a tissue of lies for, for the most part as it evolved through into all this nonsense. And again, remember I told about the, the dumbing down of psychology? That's how you get this coaching stuff and how you get all of this Anthony Robbins type of thing. You know, it's not that it's negative in and of itself. It's just that what do you have to be? You must be so low on the on the scale of self-esteem that you need some cretin like that to motivate you. Oh, yeah, motivational stuff I'm talking about. I mean, I'm not against it in and of itself, but I also have the question of, I mean, this is basics. This is ABCs. And by the way, if you really read truth sages like Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon, who wrote extensively on self-esteem, you wouldn't need to spend and make these, these guys into billionaires. The, the works are already there. And there's even work, other works I can cite on this, you know, that came out in the 70s, good authentic stuff. Uh, there, was, there was work even on subliminal, you know, uh, subliminal advertising, the hidden persuaders all came out in the 70s. Did it change anybody? Did anybody? It, the advertisements in England got worse in the 80s. They were so satanic. It was absolutely unbelievable. I had, to, I, had to, I had to watch it and decode them. So I know. Yeah, what happened to all that knowledge that came out in the seven Age of manipulation and the hidden persuaders. And that guy, Vance Pockard, wrote, I think, another three follow-ups. And then there was other books on the same subject. There was even movies with top stars like Lee Majors and Robert Mitchum uh, featuring this. There was Columbo. There was an episode of Columbo. There was, I mean, there was mainstream episodes showing the power of subliminal seduction and how negative it was, right? What happened? Everybody just rolled over and went to sleep. You know why? Because they're programmed. There's an old statement by Vernon Howard said, the man who's under psychic, psychic hypnosis is the one who never, who doesn't believe that there is such a thing on this planet. Well, how do you untie that? You can't get them to believe it because they're under the hex. You point at the billboard like I used to do when I was dumb enough to do this. I go, look, can't you see it? And that martini advertisement or that Guinness advertisement. Do you not see that? That face, that, that skull or that evil thing. What? Well, you know, it's like you're just talking about, you know, dealing with these numbskulls, these chuckleheads. You're the dumbass. You're the dumbass because you know more. Wisdom alienates you. It makes you an instant outsider. And they only believe you when you're at the Spielberg level. You know, you're talking about, you were talking about social media there. When I've got a million hits, I get another million. Not because of the content, but the other million knuckleheads. So, hey, he's got a million likes. Click. You think I want that? You think I give a shit about that? I want two likes if those people are sincere. And this is part of their spiritual quest that's brought them to my page, my work, whatever. The rest is, as, as you say, a form of programming, a form of infantilism. In fact, the internet has brought us more wisdom, more access to wisdom than anyone can ever imagine. And it's really only a, a, you know, a few decades old. The question is, what is the masses made of it? If you really want freedom, if you really wanted freedom from slavery, you'd be free right now. Because and that doesn't even include all the great movies, you know, from the '60s, all the great, mo all the Pink Floyd's, the Moody Blues, the, the the rock bands, who've already, my God, I'm not even including that. I'm just saying the straight internet from the mid '90s onwards, getting online. I mean, I was in Sweden in 2002, and people weren't even online then when I visited. So, I mean, this thing is extremely rare, uh, uh, extremely uh, short lived. But it's long enough there, it's been long enough there for if somebody really wanted absolute freedom, they'd know all about it and masses today would have overthrown their government and at least, at the very least, gone to an authentic libertarian model as sketched out by somebody like Ayn Rand and people like that. We don't see any of that. In fact, I see many of these groups having to close down. Uh, you know, I see many of these groups saying, oh, we were meant to have our meeting guys this year in Philadelphia. It's, it's cancelled. Either we've been blackballed by the venue because some arse has called up and blackballed us, or no, we're not, we're not even getting enough signups. Oh, but Bernie fucking Sanders and Jeremy bloody Corbyn and this other creature, this Cortez, shit, we'll turn out millions for that. Card-carrying Marxists are going to drag us back to the Cold War. And worse, that we'll vote for, that we can do, that we know, that we can pull off, no, no problem there, so I'll sign on for that. But just even basic things that are out there, models that free you from federal taxation, that free you from federal control. Nobody wants to know. Or on the other side, you get the extreme lunatic anarchist types with no model except chaos, freedom for all, whatever that means, you know, like the prisoner series showed, number 48, just go buck mad. That we'll sign on for as well. Well, what the fuck? What can you do? You just have to step back in the historical way and say, they're not ready yet. Let me, let me you know, focus my platform and message on those who have got this kind of eclectic brain. Their synapses are working. Yes, they can think two thoughts at the same time. You know, they can digest, they can meditate, they can find the time to read and to, and to contemplate. 
you know, I, I've never wanted anything else in my whole career. And I still, to this day, you know, don't think in terms of beyond that. If something bigger comes in the mainstream, hey, great. I'll check it out when that time comes and make my decision then. But my God, you know, I'm just, there's already too much to preoccupy me, you know, with my product projects now that are coming out there, top drawer stuff on the enslaved.com site. You know, I, I'm just about to publish this very month, two more programs, part two of my idealism. And that happens to be on the great philosopher George Barclay. There's a whole section on Ireland's forgotten genius, George Barclay. That'll be coming out at the end of the month. And then there's a thing on the tarot cards. You know, these are top drawer works with over 30 years of study behind them. Every one of them, you know, very, very uh, deep works. We make that available and it's really up to the other person, you know, to see if this is palatable for them. It's absolutely freedom. It's absolutely their choice. That's what really freedom is. Not freedom in the streets, not the freedom of the mob. This is the freedom of the individual to choose what they want for themselves, what they want for their soul, what they want for their own spiritual development, and maybe as something, a legacy they can really leave to the generation that's coming so they won't be entirely bereft of wisdom. Yeah, well said, Michael, you know, and that's that's all we can do really. And it is, a, you know, the bottom line is it's always been the case in this world that it's a free will planet pretty much, you know, like um, you have the free will to decide how much you want, how far you want to take things. And um, I suppose we should, uh, we should leave it there for this time anyway, but we should definitely have another one at some point and cover some other areas and go into some more detail because, you know, we skip through so much and there's so much to say. And and um, not just about the past, but about what's going on today. And like I was saying, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I usually, you know, record an intro separately beforehand with all your websites as well. Um, and uh, and usually in the outro too. But um, yeah, so anyway, I think uh, we should leave it there for now. But Michael, thanks so much for your time. It's been really educational and, and inspirational to, to hear from you. Well, I'd love, love to be on again. We we can do it again anytime you want there, Emmett. Uh, you know, you're a great host and I hope to have you also to speak on your experience in Unslaved not, and not too soon. You know, if you're into that, we'd love to have your feedback because we love people from different corners of the planet to come on to give their vision of what's happening in their corner of the world. So you're you're most you're most welcome to, to come on Unslaved as well. But thanks you so much for today. I really appreciate it. That's great. Yeah, well, um, oh, you're very welcome. And uh, that's a great, that'll be my first official uh, appearance as the Resolving Reality uh, boss or whatever you want to call it. So that would be cool. And um, yeah, so so um, anyway, we, we'll we'll just, uh, we'll tee up another one soon. And, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll organize that later. And whenever you want me to be on Enslaved, just give me a shot but, uh, or give me a shout. But for, um, yeah, for now, anyway, thanks, uh, Michael Desari, and It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Emmett. We'll do it again. You are listening to Resolving Reality Radio. That was my interview with Irish author Michael Thessarian. And make sure to visit michaelthessarian.com. That's Michael, T-S-A-R-I-O-N.com. And also irishoriginsofcivilization.com to study into these very important subjects of history and ancient civilizations, the origins of control and religion, secret societies, the human psyche, and much, much more. Don't forget to visit our website, resolvingreality.com, for articles, podcasts, and video content. Find our various social media and audio platforms, including our Twitter profile, at Resolving R, both capital R's. You can also find our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And visit the SoundCloud profile to download high-quality versions of the podcast episodes. We'll be back soon with episode 8 of Resolving Reality Radio. Until then, take care and enjoy Resolving Reality.